Have you ever wondered why your expensive phone is powerless without a SIM card? Think about it. You spend hundreds, sometimes thousands of dollars on a device called a smartphone, but it's not truly yours. Not unless you insert a SIM card. Not unless you sign up with a telecom provider. Not unless you agree to pay monthly bills, top up airtime, and accept that without their network, your phone is a glorified calculator. The truth is uncomfortable. We have been sold into a system, one where telecom monopolies own the bridge between your voice and the world. It's a system so normalized, we stopped asking why. But why do we need a SIM card to make a call? Why does talking cost money when it's just data moving across the air? In a quiet corner of northern Namibia, a teenager named Simon Petrus asked those very questions and then did something unthinkable. He built a phone that needs no SIM, no airtime, no telecom contract, no monthly bills. It doesn't rely on any corporate network. It just works. And that, right there, was the problem. Because what Simon built wasn't just a phone. It was a threat to business, to profit, to power. So what really happened to Simon Petrus? Why is a device that could free millions from telecom slavery still stuck in a dusty prototype? And how did Africa once again allow genius to be silenced? In this video, let's find out because the world needs to hear it. Simon Petrus wasn't born into privilege, nor molded by elite education. What set him apart wasn't access. It was an obsession. Not with fame, money, or accolades, but with the insides of dead electronics. Radios with ripped wires, TVs with cracked screens, telephones nobody used anymore. Simon saw these not as junk, but as puzzles waiting to be solved. With no formal training, he turned to the world's biggest free university, YouTube. There, he devoured tutorials, absorbed lessons, and reverse-engineered knowledge that schoolbooks never offered. They were designed to never offer that. While his classmates memorized for tests, Simon experimented with circuits, currents, and transistors. He didn't aim for good grades. He aimed for working inventions. At Abraham Ayambo Senior Secondary School, Simon's curiosity began attracting attention. When he built a two-in-one seed dryer and cooler, judges at a national competition were so stunned they assumed an engineer must have done the work for him. But his teachers, especially his science mentor, defended him. It was all Simon. Still, the whispers followed. It's hard to believe in brilliance when it doesn't come with a certificate. But what they didn't know was that Simon was working on something even bigger. Something that didn't just bend the rules of communication, but shattered them. Using discarded parts from landlines, old televisions, and radio systems, Simon quietly constructed a device that should not exist. A mobile phone that could make calls without a SIM card or airtime. It communicated via radio frequencies, a method used in military operations and walkie-talkies, but housed within a handheld mobile form. This wasn't just a phone. It was a rebellion wrapped in wires. And he did it with about $147 worth of scrap, much of it funded by his unemployed parents, who believed in their son's mission even when no one else did. When Simon unveiled the invention at a regional science fair in 2016, the response was electric. He won. Media outlets across Namibia and even international news sites picked up the story. A boy from northern Namibia had achieved something that Silicon Valley, with all its billions, had never done or never tried to do because it would end network providers' monopoly and power. In a world chained to monthly telecom bills and SIM-dependent networks, Simon had offered an alternative. In rural areas where signals were weak or non-existent, this phone could be a lifeline. But the celebration was short-lived. After the headlines faded, so did the attention. There were no partnerships, no research grants, no invitation to join innovation hubs in Cape Town, Nairobi, or even Europe. There was no funding to turn the prototype into a product. Why? Because Simon had committed an unforgivable act. He had disrupted a trillion-dollar business model. And network providers ensured no one finances Simon. That's because the telecom industry thrives on recurring revenue like airtime purchases, SIM subscriptions, and roaming fees. 
Simon's phone obliterated that model. If everyone had a phone that bypassed telecom towers and ran on free radio waves, what would happen to corporate profits, to licensing fees, to regulatory taxes, to the business of connectivity? In a world where access is sold as a commodity, Simon had dared to democratize it. Therefore, the support Simon was promised turned out to be hollow. MTC, Namibia's largest telecom provider, publicly offered him a scholarship, only to pull it quietly after he failed grade 12. It didn't matter that he had built something that could change the world. The system still required him to pass their test first. Eventually, officials denied that the scholarship was ever formally awarded. It was easier to let the world forget than to admit that genius had been failed by bureaucracy. Before we continue further, tell us, are you enjoying the video? If yes, please like and share the video and subscribe to our channel to watch more videos on Black Africa. Let's continue now. Despite all hardships, Simon didn't give up. He kept the prototype, kept refining it, kept writing letters. But what he encountered instead were rejections, some polite, others bureaucratic. The most devastating came from the Communications Regulatory Authority of Namibia, CRAN, which refused to approve the device. The reason? It didn't conform to the existing telecommunication system. You see, this wasn't a safety issue. It wasn't a matter of legality. It was a matter of conformity. Simon's phone wasn't designed to fit within the telecom grid. It was designed to bypass it entirely. And that's precisely what made it so dangerous to the system. It couldn't be monetized the way traditional phones are. It didn't feed the status quo. It offered independence. And systems built on dependence don't tolerate that. Simon's story didn't end with a startup, a tech deal, or a scholarship abroad. It ended with silence. The kind of silence that innovators in Africa know all too well. You can build something revolutionary. You can win awards. You can spark national pride. But without institutional support, all that genius can vanish like a headline that never got followed up. Today, Simon remains unemployed. His invention remains in a box, functional, but unapproved. And the world, it seems, has moved on. But Simon hasn't. He still dreams of creating things that matter. And somewhere beneath the bureaucratic noise in telecom lobbies, the truth quietly lives. A young boy in Namibia built a phone that said no to SIM cards and the system said no to him. Simon Petrus didn't just build a phone, he challenged an empire. In a world where the most basic communication is packaged, priced, and sold back to us, Simon's invention was revolutionary and liberating. A phone that bypasses SIM cards, towers, and airtime? That's not a gadget. It's an act of defiance. It threatens not just the revenue model of telecom giants, but the very architecture of power built around control through connectivity. His use of radio frequencies wasn't new. Militaries have used them for decades. But to bring that technology into a civilian mobile phone was revolutionary. It asked an uncomfortable question. If we have always had the means to talk freely, why are we still paying for permission? That's because a SIM-less phone with no recurring fees is the telecom industry's worst nightmare. It kills their business model overnight. If scaled, it would democratize communication, especially in rural, off-grid, or disaster-prone regions where traditional networks are either too expensive or non-existent. Imagine schools in remote villages being able to talk to each other, or farmers coordinating markets, without paying monthly bills. That's not innovation for profit. That's empowerment. And that's precisely why it had to be buried. But Simon's story doesn't exist in a vacuum. He is part of a continent-wide pattern, a graveyard of African brilliance. Uganda's university students built an electric car over a decade ago, yet no factory ever emerged. Gerson Mangundu from Namibia developed a homegrown social media platform. Verone Manku from Congo built a tablet long before Apple's iPad hit African shores. Kenya's Mwangi Peterson designed a car ignition system triggered by SMS. What connects all of them isn't failure, it's abandonment. Their ideas challenge the existing global order, and that's a threat too few are willing to finance. You see, Africa doesn't lack genius. It lacks the infrastructure for a genius to survive. 
Governments love posing with young inventors for photos, but rarely invest beyond the ceremony. Venture capital is often Western-funded and Western-focused. Ministries of science and technology exist in name, not function. In this broken ecosystem, young minds like Simon's are told they are not real engineers until they pass an exam or secure foreign approval. The tragedy isn't just personal, it's continental. Africa's path to autonomy is being blocked not by incompetence, but by systemic neglect. Simon could have left, he still can, but he stays in Namibia. Why? Because he doesn't want to be another African success story exported to the West. He wants to build for the people who walk miles to make a call, who can't afford data plans, who are tired of being told connectivity is a luxury. He is not chasing Silicon Valley validation. He is waiting for someone to believe, someone to fund, someone to protect his dream from vanishing. And make no mistake, Simon's real invention wasn't the phone. It was the idea that Africa could build its own solutions without asking permission. That connectivity doesn't need to come with a bill. That telecom freedom doesn't have to be a fantasy. In that sense, his device is a warning to monopolies everywhere. You can control the market, but you can't control ideas. Not forever. Now, if Africa truly wants its own Silicon Valley, then it must start where Silicon Valley did, in garages, in dorm rooms, in broken radios reassembled by boys who refuse to follow the rules. And maybe, just maybe, it already has. In a small northern town, in a school without much funding, one boy built the future. The question now isn't whether Simon was right. It's whether the rest of us are ready to catch up. What would you do if your phone no longer needed a SIM card or airtime? Would you switch today? Do you think telecom companies fear innovations like Simon's because they threaten their business model? In the comment section below, share your thoughts on what if this invention came from Silicon Valley instead of Namibia? Do you believe the world would have embraced it differently? Do you want to watch more videos like this one? If yes, subscribe to our channel and press the bell icon next to it. We bring videos on Black Africa, its history, rich arts and culture, and things the world should know about. Thanks for watching, and until the next video, stay tuned.